Okay, it's Brian, and this week we're talking about magnetic fields and forces. And let's take a look at the basic phenomenon that we're going to be looking at. First off, magnetic fields and what produces them. If you have a, a permanent magnet, you know that that makes a magnetic field. But another thing that creates a magnetic field is a current. And we're going to look at how to calculate the magnetic field from different arrangements of currents. Another thing we'll look at is magnetic fields exert forces on moving charges. And that's actually a single charge, which is flying through the air, but also charges in motion in a wire, i.e. a current. And finally, we're going to look at this fact about magnetic dipoles. They line up with fields, and that is a, uh, responsible for the attraction of magnetic materials to steel. That's something we'll talk about. Now let's take a look at the key relationships we're using in this section, but I want to stress you should do concepts first. That's really, really important. If you just use the relationships that are provided here and try to use them to solve problems without thinking about what's happening physically, um, that is not going to take you to a happy place. So concepts first, then relationships. But when you're ready for relationships, we've got handy one-stop shopping for all of your relationships here. And the first one is this. We talked about the fact that magnetic fields are produced by currents. If you're talking about the current from a long straight wire, it's this relationship right here, and this uh, R that appears here is how far are you from the wire, and the direction is given by the right-hand rule. For a coil, okay, so that's a coil of wire, and a coil of wire is like a stack of coils that is very, very tightly packed, like so. The magnetic field works like this. It depends upon the number of turns in the coil, it depends upon the current, and it depends upon the radius of the coil. And this is the relationship that we have for it. Now for a solenoid, and a solenoid is a coil that's wrapped like this, and it's got some length to it, okay? The magnetic field depends upon the number of turns, the length of the solenoid, and also the current in the solenoid. So those are the magnetic fields produced by the three common types of currents which we'll look at. Next piece, we want to look at the forces that magnetic fields exert on charges and currents. And if I have a single moving charge, the force is this. It's Q times V times B and then times the sine of alpha. Alpha is the angle, okay, between the magnetic field and the velocity. For our purposes, that's generally going to be 90 degrees. And so as a consequence, the sine of alpha is just equal to 1. So we're pretty much going to be looking at this situation here. The, f the force is equal to Q times V times B. And the direction is given by the right-hand rule for forces. For currents, same story. Um, force on a wire which is carrying a current I is I times L times B times the sine of alpha. But in principle, uh, it, that's in principle, but in practice, sine of alpha is going to be equal to 1. We're going to be looking at situations where this angle alpha is equal to 90 degrees. And so the force on the wire is just I times L times B. Force on a moving charge particle is Q times V times B. Now remember back when we were talking about electric dipoles, and one of the reasons we wrote the dipole moment back to the way we did was because the dipole moment will rotate to line up with an electric field. And a magnetic dipole is the smallest unit of magnetism. And you can think of a compass as a magnetic dipole. And magnetic dipoles will rotate to line themselves up with a magnetic field. That's We're going to use compasses to determine the magnetic field from bar magnets and other configurations of magnetic fields. And that's why we'll be able to do that. Now, let's look at the energetics. And it turns out, if you have a, a, a dipole, like this little bar magnet right here, whose dipole moment is lined up with the magnetic field, that is a lower energy state than if you have a dipole like this one here, whose dipole moment is lined up opposite the magnetic field. So you get a higher energy state here. And we can think about, this is going to be important to us. If the magnetic moment is aligned with the field, the energy is negative mu times b. If it's lined up opposite the field, it's positive mu times b. So there's a difference in energy of 2 times mu times b between those two states, where mu is the value of the magnetic moment be it of a bar magnet or an individual electron spin, et cetera, et cetera. We will see some examples of that. 
Now let's talk about the magnetic field of the Earth. If you take a compass, I'm going to take this compass and color it the way we color compasses with the North Pole being red, it will line itself up so that it's pointing toward the North, okay? And that's because magnetic field lines of the Earth go from South to North. So the magnetic field lines of the Earth come out of the Earth's South Pole and go into the Earth's North Pole. But what that means is that the Earth's South Geographic Pole is actually a North Magnetic Pole because field lines for a bar magnet come out of the North Pole of the magnet. So the Earth's magnet actually has its North Magnetic Pole at the South end of the Earth. That's really, really complicated. So here's the convention that we're going to use. Whenever we talk about the geographic poles, we're going to speak of the Santa Pole and the Penguin Pole. Santa Pole, that's where Santa lives. Penguin Pole, that's where penguins live. Okay, and so the Santa Pole, okay, is actually a South Magnetic Pole. The Penguin Pole is a North Magnetic Pole. But the important thing to know is just that the field lines of the Earth go from the Penguin Pole, they loop around, and they go into the Santa Pole, okay? Now, one of the things we'll talk about this week is creatures that use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. And one creature that unequivocally uses the Earth's magnetic field to navigate is magnetotactic bacteria. So these are bacteria that have little bits of iron in them. And they have these little single domain pieces of iron that have a really strong magnetic moment associated with them, okay? And as a consequence, they will rotate to line themselves up with the Earth's magnetic field. And the difference in energy between the bacterium being lined up with the field and being lined up opposite the field is large enough um, to actually be difficult to overcome. This bacteria will line itself up with the Earth's field whether it wants to or not. And then in the position where we are, the Earth's magnetic field actually points more down than it does north. And so the bacteria will rotate to line themselves up with the Earth's magnetic field and they just swim along the Earth's magnetic field. And they don't really care about going north and south, but they do care about going up and down. If they go up towards the surface of the water in which they live, it's more oxygen and light rich. If they go down, it's, there's less oxygen and less light. And that is an important thing for them. And so they just spend their lives navigating up and down the lines of magnetic field. Now let's look at the magnetic field from a current carrying wire. The magnitude of the field is given by this relationship right here where R is the distance from the wire, okay? And the magnetic field lines are actually little circles. So if I have a current carrying wire here, you, the magnetic field lines are going to be little circles like so. And the sense of the circle is given by the right hand rule for fields. You take your thumb and you point it in the direction of the current and then your fingers curl in the direction that the magnetic field lines go. And that will give you the sense of the, the field lines. And they go in circles, and a circle at a radius r from the center of the wire has a magnetic field given by this expression right here. By the way, mu zero, which you're going to see in lots of different expressions, is just this expression right here. It's a constant. Okay, let's take a look at the field of a current loop or a coil. So suppose I have a loop of wire and it's carrying a current that goes around like so. It's going that way and then this way. If I took this thing and I imagined taking a cross section through it like so and then rotating this whole loop around a vertical axis like so, I end up with this picture right here. And at the top of the loop, the current is coming out and at the bottom of the loop, the current is going in. The magnetic field lines work like this they come in from one side of the coil and then they go out the other side of the coil. And so they make these loops where they come out one side and then loop around and come back in the other side. So they make a loop, they come out one side, loop around and go back in the other side, like so. How do you tell which side it goes out of, which side it comes into? We use the right hand rule for current. So you wrap your hand around the coil so that your thumb is in the direction of the current and your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field lines, okay? And the only place we'll compute the magnitude of the field is at the center of the coil. At the very center of the coil, it's mu zero times n times i divided by 2r. And if n is a loop, if it's a loop, n is just equal to 1. If it's a coil, so you have multiple turns of wire on top of each other, 
okay? Then you just multiply by n the number of turns of wire. Now, if I have a solenoid, a solenoid is a little bit different. Inside a, a solenoid is kind of like wrapped like a, a slinky or a spring or something like that. And it's got some length to it. And a solenoid has a very uniform magnetic field inside it. And the magnetic field is given by mu zero times n times i divided by L. L n is the number of turns. L is the length of the solenoid. I is the current that it carries. And the current is very uniform, or the field is very uniform inside. That's important for the uses of solenoids, as we'll see. Now let's look at how you determine the force on a moving charged particle. So if I have a particle moving at a speed v in a magnetic field b, it will experience a force f, and the magnitude of the force we saw it was q times v times b times the sine of alpha, but we don't have to worry about sine of alpha. Alpha is the angle between b and v, and for our purposes, we're generally going to consider situations where that angle is equal to 90 degrees, and so sine of alpha is equal to 1. So the force is just q times v times b. The sense of it is this. The force is perpendicular to both the field and the velocity. So we and the way you determine the sense is this. Take your right hand and make this little uh, shape with it. And your thumb points in the direction of the velocity. Your index finger points in the direction of B. And your middle finger points in the direction of the force. And we will practice this in class. And that gives you the sense of the force. So let's do a quick check. If you're looking at this situation right here, charge particle, comes into this region and the magnetic field vectors, we're seeing x's, the magnetic field is going into the screen. So the magnetic field is into the screen, positively charged particle moving to the right as shown. What is the initial direction of deflection? Well, if you use the right hand rule, velocity is going that going to the right, field is going into the paper, the force is going to be directed towards the top of the paper. And so the initial direction of deflection will be upward. The particle will curve upward. And we'll do more examples like that in class. Now, magnetic fields also exert forces on currents. The direction is given by the right-hand rule, and current is the flow of positive charge. So you just take your thumb and let your thumb be in the direction of the current. So your thumb goes in the direction of the current, your next finger goes in the direction of the magnetic field, and your middle finger gives you the direction of the force. And the force on the wire is I times L times B times the sine of alpha, but we're going to consider cases where the sine of alpha is just equal to 1. And so we have that situation right there. So here's a problem I'm going to ask in class. What is the direction of the force on the current? Well, the current is going to the left. The magnetic field is going into the screen. What would be the direction of the force? You have four options. Give it some thought, and we'll do that in class. And then we'll also look at the rotation of coils in a magnetic field. Because if I have a coil, in some parts of the coil, the magnetic field is, the current is going one way, and in other parts, it's going another way. We can look at the direction of the force on the two different parts of a coil. One on the left, where the current is going in. One on the right, where the current is coming out. And it will rotate in a particular direction. That's something we'll talk about in class. Now, we'll also look at some numbers, okay? And one of the things um, I'm always interested in is to make connections to biological systems. And there is some worry that the magnetic fields from uh, transmission lines that carry high currents might be damaging to people. So let's just do a quick seat of the pants estimate to see if um, how likely that would be. So suppose you were directly on the ground underneath a high voltage transmission line that is 20 meters above the ground and it carries a current of 200 amps. The question is, what is the magnetic field here? And then two, what fraction of the Earth's field is this? The way we'll do it is this. We'll say like, okay, here's the ground. Here's my transmission line. And it's carrying a current. And the current is, of course, going to be going into, let's take it to be into the paper. So my current is going into the screen here. It's going to make magnetic field lines, and the magnetic field lines will be circles, like so. And the strength of the magnetic field is going to depend upon the current as well as how far you are from the center of the circle. Well, if I'm looking at the magnetic field on the surface of the Earth, the radius of that circle is just the 20 meters that we are below the wire. 
So I can just solve for the magnetic field due to a wire carrying a current of 200 amps at a distance of 20 meters from the wire. And we'll go ahead and complete that calculation in class. Now let's look at another application to the living world. It turns out hammerhead sharks are really, really good at detecting magnetic fields, and they use that to navigate. And we'll talk about how they do it and what they use it for um, later. Uh, it's awesome, I'll tell you that. But I got data from a research paper where someone wanted to test and say, can I unambiguously prove that hammerhead sharks can detect magnetic fields? And what they did is they took a tank, and the sharks were swimming around inside the tank, and around the tank they wrapped wire, then they passed a current through the wire, okay? And then what they would do is say, when I turn the current on, I make a magnetic field in the center of the tank. And are the sharks able to detect that field? And of course, we know how to, con how to compute the magnetic field inside a coil, okay? It's mu zero times n times i divided by two r. And we know the radius of the coil, that's just the radius of the tank, and we know the current, the current was 1.5 amps, I know the number of turns, that's 100 turns, I can compute the magnetic field in the center of the tank, and it turns out we'll finish that calculation in class, and the magnetic field is smaller than the Earth's magnetic field, So the shark, and the sharks would respond to it. When the current was flipped on, the sharks would get excited, because they had been trained that when the current was turned on, they would get a food reward. And so as soon as someone flipped the switch and turned the current on, the sharks were like, ooh, magnetic field. That means it's snack time. And so sharks are, that was a, a, one of the first tests that showed unambiguously that sharks can detect magnetic fields that are smaller in magnitude than the Earth's field. If you've ever had an MRI taken, you know what happens. They take you and they put you on this little thing and they shove you into this cylinder. Well, the cylinder is actually a big solenoid. And the point of the big solenoid is it produces a really uniform magnetic field along its axis. And so they put you in a uniform magnetic field and it lines up all the dipoles in your body. We can use that to do imaging in a way that we'll talk about. But let's just do a quick calculation. So suppose the solenoid has a length of one meter, and these are typical numbers, and a diameter of one meter. How many turns of wire would you need on that solenoid if you're looking to produce a typical field of one Tesla, and the maximum current the wires could carry is 100 amps, and that is another practical number? How many turns of wire do you need? And then secondly, how long is the wire, okay? Well, we know how to compute the magnetic field inside a solenoid. Okay, the magnetic field inside a solenoid is just equal to mu zero times n times i divided by L. And we have everything we need. We know the magnetic field. We know the current, the biggest the current can be. We know the length of the solenoid. We know mu zero, that's just a constant. And so I can compute the number of turns of wire. We will do that in class. And we're gonna compute the length. And it turns out the length of wire that you would need is about 25 kilometers. And it turns out um, the resistance of a 25 kilometer long wire is such that this is absolutely not practical with standard wire. In fact, what you have to do is you have to use wire that is super conducting um, in order to be able to achieve this. So um, MRIs, the fact that they can image inside your body with magnetic fields is kind of amazing. And the fact that they do it using wire cooled to liquid helium temperatures just makes the whole thing that much more amazing. Now, we're going to talk about the paths of charged particles in magnetic fields, and here's the interesting thing. The force on a charged particle moving in a magnetic field is always perpendicular to the velocity. We know that that's true. That's just the way magnetic fields work. And so the natural path for a magnetic field to send a charged particle in is a circle, because we know if you have a force which is always perpendicular to the velocity, that is a recipe for having circular motion. And so charged particles in magnetic fields will travel in circles. And we're going to do some calculations with that. So the first thing we'll look at is something like this. Suppose we have these four particles that are entering a magnetic field and follow the path shown. What is the field direction? Imagine them right at the start of their trajectory. The force on them is downward because it's perpendicular to the velocity. And at that instant, they are traveling to the right. So if the magnetic if the velocity is to the right, the force is towards the bottom of the screen, what magnetic field does that predict? And that predicts a magnetic field that is out of the paper, as we will talk about in class. 
And you might be saying to yourself, Brian, when do I care about charged particles going in circles and magnetic fields? And I'm going to say, you have a device in your house which uses this principle. It's your microwave oven. The way you make microwaves is you have electrons orbiting magnetic field lines at a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. So you have a really, really strong magnetic field produced by two permanent magnets right here. And inside this little chamber, there are electrons that are going in circular orbits. They're going in circular orbits around the magnetic field lines. And as they do it, they're accelerating and accelerating charged particles emit electromagnetic waves, i.e. the microwaves of your microwave oven. So it's kind of amazing. And a problem we'll solve in class is to think about what magnetic field is necessary to do this. And we're going to do three steps. And the first one is this, to write down an expression for the speed v in terms of the period t and the orbital radius r. Well, if I have a particle going in a circle, of radius r, the distance that it travels around the circle is 2 pi r. And circular motion is periodic motion, and if the period for one orbit is t, the speed is just equal to the distance divided by time, 2 pi r divided by t, and so we can write that down. The speed v is just equal to 2 pi r divided by t. And we know, since they're going in a circle, the necessary force to make a particle go in a circle is m times v squared divided by r. And that force is provided by the magnetic field. And the force on a moving charged particle in the magnetic field has just has magnitude q times v times b. We can equate those two. Um, I know the period because I know the frequency. Okay, I know the charge because the particles orbiting are just electrons. I'm looking for the magnetic field, and you're looking at this and saying like, don't you need to know the radius and the velocity? It turns out you don't. When we go ahead and combine these to calculate the magnetic field, all those terms cancel, and we end up having an expression for the magnetic field that basically just depends upon the period and the charge, both of which we know. And we'll take a look at that in class. Now, another thing we'll look at is mass spectrometry. And if you take a beam of charged particles and you put them through a magnetic field, they will go on curving paths. And the radius of the curving path depends upon the mass of the particle. So you can use uh, the path of charged particles in a magnetic field to help determine their mass. You can make a mass spectrometer. And one of the first stages you have to do is you have to take a beam of particles and get them all moving at a constant at exactly the same speed. And how do you do that? You put them through what's known as a velocity selector. So if I have a charged particle moving to the right through a pair of crossed magnetic and electric fields, we can look at the direction of the electric and the magnetic field, and it turns out they will be in opposite directions. And so you can have a situation where the net force is equal to zero. If the net force is equal to zero, there will be no deflection. Okay, And we can write down an expression for the electric and magnetic forces, we can equate them and we can come up with an expression for the speed of the particle that it can travel at to have this very, very happy result that it experiences no direct, no deflection as it passes through the field. That's one problem we'll solve in class. And then we'll follow it up with this question. We're going to look at the trajectory if the particle goes faster than the speed that you've calculated. And here's a pro tip. Okay, the force due to an electric field is just q times e. It does not change with velocity. The force due to a magnetic field is q times v times b. It does change with velocity. So if the velocity goes up, the magnetic, the force due to the magnetic field goes up as well. And think about that as you solve this problem. Finally, we're going to come to magnetic materials. And it turns out in magnetic materials, basically things made out of steel or, or other metals like nickel or cobalt or gadolinium, if you have magnetic materials, all the individual atoms have a certain spin associated with them and they will and they like to line up with an applied magnetic field. And so what will happen is you'll have regions inside the material that are called domains where all the individual spins are all lined up and they're like powerful little tiny magnets, but all the domains won't agree with each other. They will be in different directions because if all of them pointed in the same direction, that would be counter to entropy. We know um, the universe works that can like maximize disorder and so that's not going to be a thing. 
But if I bring a magnet in and I apply its magnetic field, what will happen is the domains that are favorably oriented will grow at the expense of ones that are unfavorably oriented. And so the material will be magnetized. And if you have a material that's magnetic, there's an energy payoff if it goes to a region where the field is stronger. Because if the spins line up with the magnetic field, that corresponds to a lower energy state, and they'll line up if there's an applied field. And the stronger the field, the stronger the tendency for them to line up. And so you get more energy out if you have a magnetic material move into a region where the field is stronger. And that is why magnets stick to steel things such as your refrigerator. And this is a thing I'm going to ask people to explain in class. And this is part of the focus on concepts. Why is a piece of metal attracted to a magnet? And it has to do with that energetics. So as a piece of metal moves closer to a magnet, the field increases in strength. Okay? And then it tends to line up the spins. And when you do that, you get an energetic payoff. And because of that reduction in energy, that means you're moving it when something moves closer to a magnet, something magnetic moves closer to a magnet, it's moving to a lower energy state. And so you can have a decrease in this particular form of potential energy. And so you can get some kinetic energy or some other form of energy out. Um, something will spontaneously move toward the field is stronger. Now, another thing we're going to talk about is navigation with the Earth's magnetic field. And it turns out um, magne magnetotactic bacteria absolutely navigate using the Earth's magnetic field, but also so do sea turtles. And what they use to navigate is the, not the magnetic field itself. They don't care where north and south is. They care about what their latitude is, and they can actually measure the dip angle of the Earth's field. That is the angle with respect to the horizontal that the magnetic field points in. Where we are, it points more down than it does north. Okay. And so if you look at the dip angle of the magnetic field, you can actually use that to determine where you are. And we're going to look at a test for sea turtles that someone did to determine or prove conclusively that they can use the Earth's magnetic field. And this is something we're going to talk about in class. That's going to be our grand finale for the week. And after talking about magnetism, the next thing we're going to talk about is currents that are induced when magnetic fields change. That's the subject of chapter 25, and I'll have more to say about that next week.